Well, I've been worshiping with you for the last several weeks. And like some of your members and folks in the community have been watching the live stream. I recognize some of you by the back of your heads. <clears throat> and of course, I got to know the worship team and um, really appreciate what you're doing. I love the service last week. Um, getting a sense of your history and realizing what a difference you've made in this community for so, so many years. I don't know, anybody here 170? I didn't know if any of you were here when it started. When I was talking about coming today, uh, I want to know how long to preach. So I decided I'd preach for 45 minutes. And Lamar said, that, well, that's fine, but we start leaving after 30. <clears throat> Since you enjoyed uh, homecoming last week, and I'm sure you ate a few things, homecoming always brings out the best in a Baptist church, I think. Just to give you a little idea where I come from, uh, in fact, I drove by the church that uh, my grandfather and, his, and grandmother attended in Anniston at Parker Memorial Baptist Church. I went to go, during the summer, I'd go to Bible school there. My dad uh, is, uh, is from Anniston. My uh, mom was from uh, Florence, up in Northwest Alabama. My dad went to Anniston High School, played for the Bulldogs. And one of his claims to fame was that he was on the basketball team and um, he was a high scorer in one of their games. Anniston won 12 to four, or 12 to six, <laughs> and he had four points. So he used to brag about that until we made him stop. I met uh, some of you folks this morning and I, I want to get to know you better. So I want to ask you a couple of questions. And, and while those are viewing online may not be able to participate so much in this, but you here in the room can. So I want to find out about you. Now, who is the smartest person in the room? You know, if you point to somebody else, that says something about you. And if you point to yourself, that says something else about you. <laughs> so who's the best looking person in the room? There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think delusion is good. I really do. One more question. Uh, who is the biggest, well, I'm not going to say giver, but who's the biggest sinner in this room? Well, to help you guys out, um, I got to look at your role and the church, some of your leaders helped me with it. And we went through the whole role and checked off everybody's names. And you'll be glad to know that everybody tied for first. <laughs> it only takes one sin to make a sinner. It's interesting in the Bible, there's two stories that come to mind. One is Jesus told us about these two men who went to the temple. You may know this story. One of them was a Pharisee and Pharisees were known for their uh, adherence to the law and very, very righteous, sometimes very self-righteous. There was a Pharisee and then there was a tax collector who was looked down upon by just about everybody. I know that's changed now. We all love tax collectors. But in those days, they were not regarded highly, certainly. They go to the temple to pray and the Pharisee gets up and lifts his hands and makes a big deal out of it. And it's almost as if he's not really talking to God, he's showing off. But in the process of showing off, he informs God how fortunate God is to have a man like him on, on his side. And then he denigrates the tax collector. I'm so glad I'm not like him. Well, the tax collector's not doing this. He's not lifting his voice to make sure everybody knows how pi pious he is. He can't look to heaven. He can't do anything except bend over in grief and utter these words, have mercy on me, the sinner. He didn't say a sinner. He said the sinner. Now, when Paul was writing to Timothy, he made an interesting reference to his own life. He said to his protege, his, his uh, child in the faith, he said to Timothy that he himself, he regarded himself as the chief sinner. Well, the truth of the matter is we live in a broken world. We all know that. You may be thinking, what does all this have to do with the title of the sermon? What kind of pie do you want? Well, you may have asked that question last week at homecoming. I wonder if you've ever had to be served a piece of humble pie. You know what that is? Is that a familiar phrase to you? You know where that originated? 
You know, there really was a humble pie. It makes you stop and think next time you get one of those um, chicken pot pies, you better make sure there's chicken in them. Because the original humble pie had things like uh, animal guts. I hate to say that on a Sunday morning. My mother would not be pleased. But you would get whatever was left over after a, uh, an animal had been slaughtered and they put it in a pie. Makes you look forward to lunch today, doesn't it? Yeah. But we understand humble pie to, be, to suggest that we need to be put in our place. We need to be humbled. Humility before at the time of Christ was always viewed as a, a weakness, even a vice. But something changed when Jesus came on the scene. When he entered the world, he demonstrated what true humility is all about. I want to read a few verses from Philippians chapter 2. Contained in this passage is an ancient Christian hymn. All throughout the Bible, we have great music. We have a hymn book right in the center of your Bible. But here in Philippians 2, Paul makes reference to this, this hymn that portrays Christ as a humble figure. Listen to these words, because I think at this time in the life of your church, we want to be this kind of community. Listen to these words from Paul. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility... Regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Now, I hope you know the rest of that because this is where our view of Christ gets elevated. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the one we honor. That's the one we worship. But I love the fact that when Jesus was on this earth, he never did this. He always did that. If you notice here, there are two words that are inextricably, uh, inextricably connected. Humility and obedience. We're going to dive into that just a little bit this morning. I want you to to understand a few things. I try to understand these things. Humility is observed. It's not claimed. If someone came up to you and said, well, I'm just a modest kind of person. I'm just a humble guy. I'm not going to take you seriously. It's an interesting story about Abraham Lincoln. I know y'all want to talk about politics this morning, don't you? Woo, what a mess. The sto story is told of, of Lincoln when he was a president one day, an aide found him downstairs in the White House in one of these small rooms, and he was on a bench, and he was blacking or polishing his boots. The aide was absolutely shocked. Mr. President, you shouldn't be blacking your own boots. President Lincoln looked up and says, well, whose boots should I be polishing? The person who demonstrates humility actually reflects how God looks at us and wants us to live our lives. For we all have a reason to be humble in the face of what Jesus accomplished on our behalf. Now here's a phrase I bet you know. I'm going to break it apart. Sinner saved by grace. Four words. First, sinner. We've already established the fact that we all are sinners. The only one not tainted by sin was the one who took all of that sin upon himself. The Bible says he became sin for us. Can you imagine that awful scene on the cross? Jesus is in agony. 
And there's that moment when he feels absolutely abandoned. And he looks to the, to the heavens. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's almost as if at that moment in the hideous image of sin, the father had to turn away. He could not look upon it. We're sinners. An evangelist in a small town was conducting a revival. You remember revivals, don't you? While he was there, he went to the barber shop, and there he got a haircut and a shave. And while he's sitting in the chair, this, this barber begins to talk. Have you ever noticed that people who work with hair like to talk? Well, he went on and on about this. He knew the guy was a preacher and, and he had been at one of the services, but he informed this visiting evangelist that he'd reached a point in his spiritual life where he no longer sinned. Now, the evangelist is sitting in the chair and the barber has a really sharp razor that he's about to use on his neck, so he decides not to argue with the man. But folks, that's just not possible. Our sinful nature is not going to be dealt with by our effort. We're not going to be able to overcome the presence of sin in our lives. None of us can reach the point where we can master our sinful nature. We are sinners, and the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. Now, I think it's awful enough to think about the end of our physical life. Well, I was thinking about Lamar's mother as he was telling me a little bit about her life and realizing that death it wasn't a, a bad thing. Not for a woman who loved the Lord and loved her family, took care of so many people. No, that's not the death this is speaking about. This is far worse. For this death is the eternal death. This is the separation from God that never ends which is why Jesus came in the first place. He doesn't want us to be lost forever. But that's not the end of the story. What's the next word? Sinner, I'm glad you're with me. Saved. When I was <clears throat> five years old, just a few years ago, I was playing spaceship with my next door neighbor he was a couple years older than me, and we were down in his basement. <clears throat> now, we were playing spaceship. Now, in the basement, you, you're likely to have, you know, your washing machine and your dryer, and they did. So I'm playing spaceship. Now, what would you think would be a good spaceship down in the basement? How about dryer? Because dryer has a window, right? Right? So spaceship and space boy... I get put inside the dryer. My friend decides he's got other things to do, so he go, goes off and leaves me. Now, the, go, the, the guy's brother, uh, mother came down after a while. Thank goodness she did. She found little boy Blue inside the dryer. And if she hadn't come and gotten me out of that dryer, you'd be having another preacher here today. I could not rescue myself. Someone else had to save me. Paul wrote in Romans, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now that, Paul loved athletic images. But this is an athletic image. The image is of an archer. Now let's just imagine that among us today there is a gold medal winning archer. And we're going to ask you to participate in a contest. And we want to use, use all of your skill. There's just one challenge. You're going to stand here, here in the state of Alabama, but the target is in New York. Now, I don't care how skilled you are, you're not hitting that target, are you? For all have come short of the glory of God. We can't get that high. There's no way. You know, it's interesting that most people in America think about the fact that if we're just good enough, or if I'm not bad enough, I get to go to heaven. Let's keep going. What's the next word? By. We need a connector. These two letters are very important. It describes how the rescue takes place. Somebody has to do the rescuing. 
Some process has to be in place so that the person who is helpless and hopeless has a chance. So our next word is grace. As I mentioned, a lot of people believe, about 75% of Americans believe in heaven. And most of the people who believe that there's a heaven believe the way you get there is by your behavior, your, your accomplishments, your list of good works. That's not anywhere in the Bible. It isn't true. You can't do it. You're stuck in that dryer. You need somebody to come and open that door. And you know somebody did? Not because I deserved it. Not because I was a good boy. But I was in trouble. I was in danger. I was going to lose my life. Somebody had to open that door. Listen to what Paul says a little bit later in Philippians. Or the, no, actually, this is in Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. Paul knew us. He knew human nature. He knew that if we could take credit for it, we would. But we can't. You see why humility is the mark of the believer? I believe one of our greatest weaknesses, believers, is spiritual pride. Let me see if I can explain. Someone has said that we have become uncomfortable with worm theology. Have you ever heard that term? Worm theology? A long time ago, a man named Isaac Watts <clears throat> wrote the text of a familiar hymn to many of us, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. The first verse reads, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head, in the original text it says, for such a worm as I? I don't know the last time you looked in the mirror and said, man, you are nothing but a worm. I hope you hadn't said it to your children or whoever else, but we don't like to think that way. But we are trapped in the stench of sin. We cannot extricate ourselves. You may not like it, but that's the truth. And it's only by the act of a gracious Savior that we have a hope. So how does that humble pie look now? There's a character in the New Testament. I'm writing a book about him, actually. Not too much. We don't know a lot about him. His name is John. They called him the baptizer. He attracted quite a following, created a buzz from the highest to the lowest of society. People came out there to see this wild man and to hear him. You see, for 400 years, there had been no prophetic voice in the land. And here comes this guy. And he spoke words of conviction. And people listened, and many responded. And they thought John was a big deal. In fact, they thought maybe he was the, the one they'd been looking for. And John had to tone that down. He says, I'm not even fit to untie the sandals of the one who's coming. A little bit later on, as he began to realize that the ministry of Jesus was really catching steam, he knew that he had to fulfill what he had been called to do and then step back. And he said this. He said, he must increase and I must decrease. You talk about humility. C.S. Lewis defined humility like this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. Isn't that what Paul wrote? Those words we just read a few moments ago from Philippians chapter 2. To think more highly of others than you do of yourself. That doesn't put you down, but it does put you in your place. Now, I would suggest that being in our place is not a bad thing. John knew his place. No, I'm not the Lamb of God. He's coming, and I'm supposed to prepare the way. But I'm not him. Knowing your place isn't degradation. It's understanding your unique role in the life that God's given you. And let me just play with you a bit with a word. It's the word place. And I'm going to take each of those letters and talk about a particular aspect 
of the humble person. The P stands for personality. Some of us are introverts and some of us are extroverts. Are you a glass half full kind of person? Or are you a glass half empty kind of person? Are you the kind of person who makes people glad when you enter the room or make them glad when you leave? God's help. The unique person that you are can blossom. You can become the person God has in mind. How did Jesus arrive at that? Through humility and obedience. He did what the Father commissioned him to do. You have something with your life that no one else has. You are absolutely unique. There's nobody else like you. Now, you may have somebody in your life say, thank goodness. But the truth of the matter is, your uniqueness is a gift to the world. Your personality is you. Second letter, the L, is for learning. Let me ask you this question. Of all the, all the knowledge that there is in the universe, how much do you possess? 10%? Five? I don't think they could put a decimal and enough zeros in front of mine. The older I get, the more I realize how little I know. And the thing that amazes me is how arrogant we humans can be. You know, we were absolutely convinced that the sun revolved around the earth. We were absolutely convinced that the earth was flat. We we're absolutely convinced that we have the answers to all our problems. Why can't we solve them? Years ago, President Roosevelt had a friend in the Oval Office and they were talking together about the condition of the war-torn world back in the 40s. After a while, the president asked his friend to wheel him outside, as most of you know, he was wheelchair-bound for most of his adult life. They took out, he took him outside and they found a place where they could look up and see the night sky. It's not easy to do in a busy place like Washington. But they found a place they could look up. And after a while, as he gazed at the multitude of stars, President Roosevelt turned to his friend and said, Okay, I feel small enough now. Take me back inside. We were part of a grand scheme. And the amazing thing is that we have a part in the grand scheme. You matter. Your life matters. All lives matter. Not to get too deep into that one. But here's the truth. When we stop learning, we become irrelevant. I don't know what your profession is. But if you haven't stayed up, on what you need to know to be effective, not just today, but tomorrow, you're getting passed by. We have to keep learning. We have to keep growing. I hope that you're a lifelong learner. I hope you love to read, and I hope that you'll expose yourself to ideas, some of them that you might not agree with, but you need to understand what people are saying and thinking and feeling so that you might be more of who God wants you to be. The A stands for attitude. Have you ever been accused of having a bad attitude? Yeah, my brothers were often accused of having a bad attitude. It's a cliche, but I think it's still true. Attitude determines altitude. How far do you want to reach? What do your dreams say about you? What is your outlook on life? What is your worldview? Are you a pessimist, a cynic, a skeptic? Or is there something in you that believes that God has this in his hands? Man, we need that, that affirmation more and more. There's a reason why his story can be broken down into two words. You know that. His story, not history. His story. I know people who are living to die, just get it over with. 
but I also know people who are dying to live. I love carpe diem kind of folks who seize the day, who believe in themselves, who are comfortable in their own skins, whose attitude is, I'm going to do better. Some of you remember Joe Namath? Anybody remember Joe Namath? Nobody remembers Joe Namath? Thank you. You know the book he wrote? I can't wait till tomorrow because I get better looking every day. Have you seen Joe Namath lately? It ain't true. <laughs> the next word is character. What are you like when no one's watching? It's easy to put on a show. You can do that here at church. But who's the real you? Who is the audience you're trying to please? You know there's only one audience that matters. After a heavy snowstorm, a man had to go out to the shed behind his house. And he had to get a snow shovel to start clearing some of the snow away. He came, circled back around to the house, and he looked out the front window, and he noticed his little boy was out there trying to match his deep footprints in the snow. He jumped from one to the next to the next, trying to be just like his daddy. And it hit that man full force. I better watch where I step, because he's watching where I step. What's your character say about you? The E is experience. A woman named Rita Mae Brown said, good decisions come from experience, and experience comes from bad decisions. We have to learn, sometimes the hard way. And a part of who we are is how we react when we fall, when we get knocked down, when we fail. Experience helps us to learn that we can get back up. And we love a God who loves us so much that he's the God of second chances. I hope you know that. I hope you believe that. I hope you experience it. So perhaps humble pie isn't so bad after all. Christ taught us by his own example that humility coupled with obedience honors and pleases the Father. And I know I need to wrap up here. I'll try to do this quickly. My dad um, was a second chair guy. Do you know what that means? If you've ever played in a band, an orchestra, or whatever, um, there's always a first chair, you know, the best. My dad was not like that. There's some people who have to be in the spotlight, who thrive on applause, who want to be first in line when the credit's handed out. We need first chair people. We need people leading the way. We need them to use their gifts but being in the first chair, they can not only succeed spectacularly, they can also fail spectacularly. The spotlight can burn bright and reveal some flaws. Start reading your own press clippings only to find out that your fans are pulling for you to fall off that mountain, not stay on top of it. Our pride can blow up in our faces. Jesus cautioned about that, not just once. He told a story about a man who went to a feast, a banquet. And the man was trying to sit up at the head table and the host said, I'm sorry, sir, these seats are reserved. And he had to go sit at the very bottom, the last seat. Our pride can get us into trouble. My dad knew his place because he had the heart of a servant. He didn't try to be somebody he wasn't. He knew his strengths and his weaknesses. He had enough challenges being the best he could be, which is true of all of us. He was a good model for his three sons and for a lot of people who came to know and love him. He loved to laugh and he loved to eat. It's hard to find a Baptist who doesn't love to eat. At dessert time, if you said to him, what kind of pie do you want? He would say yes. And some of you know that sentiment. What does it look like to be truly humble? Booker T. Washington, the renowned black educator, was an outstanding example of this truth. Shortly after he took over the presidency of Tuskegee Institute here in our state, he was walking in an exclusive section of town and he was stopped by a wealthy white woman. Not knowing who he was, not knowing he was famous, she asked if he'd like to earn a few dollars by chopping some wood for her. 
Booker T. Washington responded with a smile. He rolled up his sleeves and proceeded to do the humble chore that she had requested. When he was finished, he carried the logs inside the house and stacked them by the fireplace. There he met a little girl who recognized him and later revealed his identity to the woman of the house. The next morning, the embarrassed woman went to see Booker T. Washington in his office at the Institute and apologized profusely. He said, it's perfectly all right, madam. Occasionally, I enjoy a little manual labor because it's always a delight to do something for a friend. She took, shook his hand warmly and assured him that his meek and gracious attitude had endeared him to her and his work to her heart. Not long afterward, the Tuskegee Institute received a number of large donations. And that effort was pushed along by that same woman who wanted, wanted to honor a man who was willing to be humble. Now being humble doesn't mean you're putting yourself down all the time. It's recognizing who you are in God's sight. Uh, one other story quickly. Henry Augustus Rowland, that's a great name, isn't it? Henry Augustus Rowland was a professor of physics at John Hopkins University. And as happened occasionally, he was called to be an ex, uh, expert witness at a trial. And when he was brought up to give testimony, the attorney demanded of him, what are your qualifications as an expert witness in this case? The normally modest and retiring professor rep replied quietly, I am the greatest living expert on the subject under discussion. Later, a friend who knew him pretty well said, I was shocked that you said that. Dr. Rowland answered, well, what'd you expect me to do? I was under oath. <laughs> Jesus said we are to love God with all we are and all we have. And we are to love others as we love ourselves. If you don't love yourself, you're not going to be able to love others. And you're not going to be able to love God. God isn't, isn't responsible for accidents. You're not a mistake. You are a gift. And I want you to remember that. And I want these words to echo in your mind as we close today. How cool is it? The same God who created mountains and oceans and galaxies thought the world needed one of you too. Let's pray. Lord, in this broken world, we are a broken people. But we are not a forsaken people. We are not a helpless or hopeless people. For we lean on the everlasting arms of our Lord who demonstrated grace, who gave us when we didn't deserve anything. He gave us hope he gave us life. Thank you for the example that your son set. That we can be humble and obedient to a higher purpose and a higher authority. And that the only audience that we ever need to please is you. So maybe today we've been down in the dumps. Maybe we've been through some bouts of depression. This awful pandemic has created all kinds of problems and can easily lead to despair. But maybe this morning we just need to remind ourselves that we were made by an eternal God who loved us so much that he claims us for his own, adopting us into his own family, calling us children, joint heirs of Jesus Christ. And Lord, with that assurance, help us to hold our heads high and help us to know our place, a place that you have made for us, a place that you will empower us to accomplish. And we offer you our praise, our thanks, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.